Hello, my name is Arsalan Kazemi with the Iranian national basketball team, and you are listening to Gold Bazaar. <laughs> Oh, it's a poor pass, a turnover. And now he ran transition four against two. Give it up. Two time! Threw it down. There's the turnover. Now he ran will punish you. Four against two. Kazemi, this is my house throws it down what a dunk all right guys thanks so much for joining uh, on this special edition of go bizan kind of deviating a little bit from the latest in team elite football to focus on just the olympics the uh, post olympics you, you could say uh, really privileged to be joined by one of the all-time greats in in iran basketball today and he has uh, american connections He's very decorated in Iran. He recently led Iran to the Olympics, where they played against the likes of Czech Republic, United States, France. Uh, he is uh, Arsalan Kazemi. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Arsalan, and I'm here with the Globazan podcast and uh, ready to go. Arya, thanks for hopping on as well. No, I appreciate that. I will say I appreciate Arsalan coming on our, our, our podcast, giving us time. Uh, they played great in the Olympics. We're really proud to see them uh, go out there. And yeah, hopefully we can do a good interview. He's the first Iranian-born player to be drafted in the NBA in, the, in 2013, drafted by the Wizards and then to the 76ers. Kind of became a, a fan favorite playing with the uh, Summer League of uh, the 76ers. He also played uh, with the likes, the uh, Chongqing Soaring Dragons of Chinese Basketball Association, for the Atlanta Hawks, and briefly with the uh, Houston Rockets, played in the run for the last uh, few years. Uh, he played at college for Rice University in Houston, as well as the University uh, of Oregon, leading them to the, uh, the uh, NCAA tournament back in, was that 20, 20, uh, 2013, I believe. Arsenal went to the Sweet 16, right? You only lost to the eventual national champions, Louisville Cardinals, right? Uh, correct. Uh, we only lost to Louisville. And then uh, they had that whole uh, sexual thing at Louisville and they got suspended. So maybe if we wouldn't have to face them, we would have won a championship that year. Yeah, you never know. You, you played for a well-decorated coach of Dana Altman as well. We'll get into that later on, but heading into the questions now, we received quite a bit of fan questions. We have a lot of great questions that we'll, uh, we'll get to ask him, and it's just an awesome uh, pleasure to do so. Uh, Ari, I'll let you start off, man. Asad, I want to ask you something, uh, obviously, regarding your upbringing in Iran. Obviously, you grew up in Isfahan. Basketball, naturally, isn't the biggest sport in Iran. It's obviously football, but you know, what was, what made you get into basketball? What was the passion? What what drove you into that sport? Was football ever something that you, you started into? Well, that's a great question. So as an uh, Iranian kid growing up and I mean, Esfahan, but it really didn't matter where you grew up. It's kind of like uh, Brazil, man. Uh, there is a ball in every street and people playing uh, football. You know, so obviously I started with football too. I was really into it. Uh, I had an uncle, uh, Dai, as we say, uh, that he was uh, really into uh, football at the time. And obviously he got me into it as well. And I was playing football. But uh, to be honest with you, uh, I was really good at uh, a lot of different sports. Uh, don't want to uh, brag, but uh, I played tennis i'm still pretty good at it i'm really good at volleyball really good at ping pong swimming so but kind of like i tried every different sport but uh you know like we have eight uh it's like the christmas of the iranians and uh my mom got me a basketball and uh that's how i started falling in love with the game so when she got me that basketball i think maybe like Two, three months later, we uh, went and bought a hoop for the yard and 
I learned how to shoot, make play up everything on my own in the backyard. And then everything just took off from there. You know, were you, just got, yeah. were you always so a tall, I, were you always a tall kid? Uh, yes. Uh, I remember, like, I, I don't remember actually because I was just a little kid, but my mom told me like, you know, when you're a kid, they take you to the, like a baby doctor. Uh, the doctor told my mom to go and buy your kid a basketball. He's going to be like two meter tall and I'm 201. So the doctor was pretty darn right. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and obviously you, you, you made it. It was worth obviously go, you went to college. Um, what made it worth pursuing that kind of career in college? Uh, okay. So when I came here, I had no clue about college basketball. And back then, it wasn't like right now, like the social media wasn't that big, like there was no Instagram, YouTube wasn't as big, and we didn't even have ac access to it. Like I think till, uh, till up I was like 14, 15 years old in Iran, we were still using like dial up net. So it was really hard to like uh, get into like these kind of things online and like all we could watch was like 6 a.m. And, and a Friday morning, which is like a Sunday in America uh, or overseas. Uh, we would wake up just to watch like a few hours of uh, basketball and they would like censor the hell out of it because of the cheerleaders and all that, that they're involved in the NBA game. So I had no clue <laughs> about college basketball. And uh, so what happened was I was playing in the, Waba, which is like the West Asian games under nine, under 18 at the time. And I was uh, 17 years old and uh, we had a really good tournament. I played really good. And uh, when I still see my stats from back in the days, it would give me goosebumps. I had like 20 points, 20 rebounds. It was, it was crazy. So there was a guy, like he was a manager of the Lebanese basketball team. And then, um, like after the game and I wasn't speaking uh, good English. And then uh, my mom and dad, they were at the gym. We were playing at the Azadi. Iran was hosting the tournament. And he came and told my parents, my mom speaks pretty good English because uh, she got her degree in English. Uh, came and told her that uh, I think your son uh, is pretty good and he can go and go into the US and he can have a bright future. And they were like, okay, you know, what, what we need to do. And they were supportive from day one. So they did whatever it, uh, it took to like send me to US. It was, it was really hard too for them as well because they had to let go of their kid in an early age. But uh, I mean, so when I came here, uh, I went to high school. And then that year that I was in high school, I started to like knowing about like how, what college basketball is probably back home. I would, I just heard of like North Carolina because Michael Jordan been there and one other team UCLA because like tons of Iranians, they live in California. And uh, I, I have, I had seen some people probably wear, uh, wear like UCLA shirts or whatever. So I just know maybe two colleges when I was home. So that's, that's how I got, how it, like it got started when I came to Lenore, North Carolina to play uh, high school basketball. And I started getting to know about colleges, you know. We'll come on to that later on about obviously youth, young, young people in Iran playing basketball. But um, you're mentioning your parents and how important they were in you pursuing a career in America. Um, now, we speak about that a lot when we come to young people in sport within Iran. The parents sometimes are a little bit against uh, their kids going into sport. Obviously, your parents were the complete opposite. They're very supportive. How important was that to, for you? Well, it is very important. Uh, and my parents from day one, they never forced me to do anything. Like, obviously, like every other Iranian parents, they were tough on school they wanted me to get my degree but they, they were never like forcing me to do something you know like forcing me to become a doctor because like right now uh, or not right now it's been like a, a century I think that like all Iranian parents they want their kids to be their doctor or uh, like doctor or Mohandas you know uh, so uh, with my parents that wasn't the deal they always wanted me to pursue 
what I like most, you know, and they were hundred percent supportive. Like I remember even like my mom and dad, they would come like to practices, sit there for like four or five hours and then like take me back home, drive me to practices. Most of the times, like whenever they could, uh, they put their 200%, you know, not even a hundred percent. So uh, I always appreciate what they did for me, but it's really important, you know, like, for, for, I mean, some, like I, I say this, but like some, some people, when they grow up, uh, they're just on their own. And I understand that, but that wasn't the case for me. Like my parents, they were always supporting me and uh, they still support me, you know? And uh, I think for me, that was the big part of it. And like, even like coming to US, uh, I didn't even want to come, you know? I just, uh, it's like how you say, like I just started to like blow in Iran, you know, um, I was a national team captain. I was playing pretty good. I had like a lot of attentions and they wanted me to come to US and I was like, no, I don't want to go, you know, and I was really spoiled uh, growing up. So, uh, and uh, so they basically like, like, this is good for your life. You need to go. So they send me uh, to North Carolina and we'll get to that uh, in a second, I guess. Good man, good man. Well, and you were one of the, I, I believe, I mean, one of the first, if not the first Iranian-born players to play NCAA basketball, especially on, on scholarship. And on that note, Arsalan, you were you know, pursued by a few big-name colleges with storied basketball legacies you talk about the maryland terrapins talk about oklahoma state uh missouri which was uh at that time still coached by mike anderson i believe and who had experience as a uh, assistant coach winning the national championship he took missouri to the elite eight he also had nebraska and then rice of course offering you and seton hall which is also a, a very successful private school uh do you still feel like Selecting Rice University in Houston, Texas was uh, was the right fit for you at the time? Uh, well, uh, to be honest with you, um, so I told you when I, when I came to U.S., I started learning about colleges, and I had only one year to start, like, learning. And I'm, uh, like, you guys don't know me in person, but, like, I'm, I'm really selective and, um, like, it's, it's hard for me to like communicate with new people, you know, like, I mean, I mean, I'm pretty cool and chill after I get to know people, but it's really tough for me at the beginning. So uh, the guy who helped me brought me over. Uh, so I landed in Houston first, and then I went to North Carolina, the Lebanese guy that he was helping me. And he's basically like my family right now. And uh, so when I was getting offer from all these colleges and I got an offer from Houston. So when I came to Houston, Houston felt like home, you know, we were, uh, I mean, during the summers I was living like, I don't know, 30 minutes away from Rice University. And uh, I mean, probably like the biggest mistake was I didn't take my official visit to like other colleges, but I think at the time, Rice was a great decision for me because it wasn't one of those, like, as you mentioned, like I, I received offer from a lot of division one high majors as well. And uh, if I would have gone there, I, I would probably have to sit on a bench for like the first two years and the third year you didn't know because they would, they could have bring an all American at any time. And then I would have had to sit maybe like the whole four years on the bench, you know? Uh, but I think, uh, picking rice and also rice is a great academic school you guys probably know that and my parents they were always insisting me to like get a, a good degree uh, so everything came together and I picked rice because uh, I thought that uh, Houston was home I mean it's still home you know <laughs> so uh, I never regret that decision I think I made the right decision and is that where you are now Arsalan? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a house in Houston, five minutes away from Rice University, and I still go there, and uh, I just love it, you know? It's home. <laughs> wow. What, what, what part, of, what neighborhood of Houston is that, man? Uh, they call it Rice Village. 
Oh man, it, so, it, it, yeah. for whoever is listening, if you go to Rice Village, it's one of the nicest parts of Houston. I grew up in Houston and that's a place where you want to get brunch. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You're right. You did have a successful time at Rice. You uh, got Conference USA. Uh, you seem to pretty much average uh, a double-double almost your entire time there. And you were also able to get, you know, player of the week sometimes. Played against some players that ended up having very successful careers. But then you, you also uh, transferred to Oregon to uh, finish out your college career. You Play for Dana Altman, who has a, has a storied career in the college ranks. He's led Oregon to deep runs in the NCAA tournament, including uh, the last couple of years. What went into that, and uh, you know, how, how did that prepare you for your professional career going forward? Well, just a note: I'm still leading double double by Conference USA uh, in double double. So. That's one of the records I'm holding right now. All right, we'll give you props. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, I like to basically clarify that because like I never did an interview and like it's it's long gone from there. But when I when I wanted to transfer, basically I could have gone anywhere that I wanted to because I had offer from everywhere. I had Kentucky, Duke, like all the elite colleges. They were making me an offer, but uh, one of the problem was it was so late into the semester that I didn't want to sit out. And uh, in order for me not to sit out, I had to go to the school that it was on a quarter system, which Oregon is. My top choice was UCLA because I really wanted to go and play there, you know, uh, and it's LA, obviously. <laughs> so that was my top choice, but they were on a semester system and if I would have gone there, I had to sit out a year. And I didn't want to do that. So I transferred to Oregon. And at the time, I didn't know like a lot of people there, but uh, I'm still connected to the Oregon as well. Coach Dana is probably one of the best, if not the best coach that I played for. Uh, coach McKenna, he played in NBA, dropped 30 points on Michael Jordan. So he was, he was pretty cool <laughs> to get coached by. <laughs> And uh, a lot of other coaches, Coach Stubblefield, Coach Fish, uh, and some other coaches, uh, Steve, uh, he's, uh, he's a coach for, I think, DePaul now with Tony. They, they moved there together. So uh, moving to Oregon, it was also a fun experience. They feel night went there, so they had everything Nike, customized, cool court years you know that was a pretty cool experience and to be honest with you that was like for me experiencing the real uh, co college athlete life and you also earned the nickname beast of the middle east did you did you, did you like that well i think uh in general like in college whoever goes from middle east to the college he, he gets that nickname but uh yeah i mean i i i have seen some signs on the court as well like he's from middle east uh batman from iran a lot of a lot of cool nicknames man <laughs> we spoke about obvious esfahan already but um which which club do you support in iran is it zobahan uh you were talking about yeah, soccer football yeah soccer yeah well, to be honest with you, let me put it this way. Uh, I have I have some friends. Uh, so, like, I know Shoja Khalil Zadeh pretty well. Right, And right. Uh, I know Suru Shafi very well, you know? Yeah. So, whenever they play, I cheer for them, you know? Let's let's put it that way. It's it's better, <laughs> you know? So, I, I mostly, like, cheer for, for the teams. I... Uh, I used to uh, support the teams that they're from Esfahan, you know, but yeah. I didn't, I never got any love from any of them. So I'm, I'm just done with them, you know? So right now I don't support any uh, like football team in Iran. I just support the team that I have friends in it, you know? Um, and obviously speaking on the, the national team um, coming on to football again, um, we're we're in a good we're in a good period right now the national team of Iran and I know you watched the games in June 
Um, so, yeah. I know you. I know you. You, know, you, you support Khalil Zadeh. He's a good friend of yours. Uh, how impressed are you with this current national team? What What's the sort of consensus within the basketball national team? You know, what are what did what are their thoughts of the the football team? Well, uh, I mean, we have good connections uh, with most of the guys, and we were really happy. Obviously, soccer is the biggest sports in Iran, or football. I keep on saying soccer because these Americans they just say <laughs> soccer. So, so Fair like foot, 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 football is the uh, biggest sports in Iran and biggest sport in Iran, and uh, everybody supports them team Melly, and we were really happy on that. Uh, last I think four games that they played and they they beat everybody and to be honest with you I was thinking about it like uh, I I really like Carlos K. Roche, you know and no, I, I didn't care what what people said I, I like what he did with the national team you know he uh, how you say it, like um like they they were they were known for something you know mm. it's different, Ident- like identity when, that's identity, something. exactly, yeah. exactly. So they, they, he gave them an identity, just like uh, that guy, the guy from the volleyball team, like the coach, uh, the Argentinian guy, he gave the volleyball team. Yeah, he gave the volleyball team an identity. So uh, I really liked him, but I was I was thinking this uh, other guy uh, that he was a coach, and I think I don't think if he was making million or billions, whatever. Uh, he was just a normal guy. He came and I think he got the be- best result out of yeah. any coaches that coached our national team for the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years. So I was like, might as well just keep him. And I, I guess the guys were happy because if you have a good coach and you're happy, you do your best, you know, and it looks like that they were doing great. You know, Tarami was, I mean, he's been playing out of his mind for the past two years and it's great I'm really happy for him and like Sardar Osmond he's playing good John Bash uh, Salma Wodus they all playing incredible and I don't want to leave out any names you know because in soccer uh, or football everybody just looks at the guy who scores uh, more goals but they were playing great as a team you know so hats off to them now, now you brought up Carlos Queiroz, and obviously you just, you just mentioned your friends of Khalil Zadeh. Now it's very important for me to ask this question because it, it's kind of, in our own discussions on our own podcast, it's, it's been discussed a lot about them to their relationship off the pitch. If you want to answer it, you don't have to answer it. What I don't know if you ever spoke to him about this before, but Khalil Zadeh never got called up much by Carlos Queiroz, especially towards the end of his reign. What was that? What, why was that? Can you give us anything? Do you know anything about um, that? I don't know anything about it, uh, but I've worked with the foreigner coach as well. And right. uh, I think I think in general, like some of the foreigner coaches that they come and coach the national team, it's just much easier for them uh, to keep their team away from like all the nagging that is going on in the media right. just to like bring some guys from like outside, you know, I remember Carl, Carlos Queiroz was inviting everybody, like whoever was playing even like in a second division in uh, just like a foreign league, you know, he would invite him to the national team and he wasn't inviting some of the best guys that they had in the league. So I think it was just that, you know, like he, he just he just didn't want any like outside stories, you know, like Hashia, if you know what I mean. Right. No, I understand. Yeah, I understand. yeah. Yeah, no, no, no contract. No that, that was the that was the main reason. You know? Well, yeah. Ar- Ar- Arsenal, maybe maybe you can help us uh, get get him to come on uh, on the show so we can interview him for ourselves. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I will tell him, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Next question um, is regarding your own contract currently. Um, can you just give us a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Well, like where I'm gonna play next? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't decided yet, but uh, I mean, I have decided, but there is a little bit of issue. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I will find out in like two weeks. So we'll see. So you've left um, Chemidor home, right? Yes, yes, yes. I okay. left Chemidor. They had a whole change of a, a roster, you know. So I left Chemidor and. Uh, 
most likely I will play uh, I will play for Mahram, but uh, we will find out in two weeks. Well, on on that note, uh, Arsalan, uh, as as we mentioned, you have uh, plenty of uh, NBA uh, experience dealing with the locker rooms, uh, summer league experience with a few uh, few teams. I want to ask, what's the difference you think between the quality of a league like the summer league and a full league like like uh, what you have in Iran? I don't even know where to start. <laughs> like we are like in I think in Iran, we're still so far behind just from like the uh, point of like analyzing the the game, you know, like the facilities, like the the things that they have that they work on it, you know, uh, it's it's just uh, like you see, like how we say we're from a third world country, and like U.S. is like the <laughs> I don't know how they say like the first world, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, in, it, in terms, it, it, in terms of, of, of it, I guess, ambition though, are, are so long. Like, like, are, are there players that are hungry to advance to a bigger league? Like, say, uh, just, I mean, yes. just as comparison yeah. in Europe. See, or... see like, the, the, the problem is, like, that, that is one of the main problems. Then I didn't know that. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've made in my career by after getting drafted, going back to Iran. So, Iran over there, we have a great, great league, you know? We, we probably like number one or number two league in Asia, you know, it's, it's a great league. We have the teams, they have foreigners, we, we play great. The problem is there is nobody, like none of the scouts because of like all the sanctions that we have, no, nobody is overlooking that league, you know? So even like in Iran, if you drop, I don't know, 50 points, 40 points, 30 points, there's not a single scout like in the U.S. that is going to find out, oh, this kid is averaging 30 in Iran, you know? So that's, that is the main issue right now with Iran basketball. We have, we have great players. Our, our junior team just uh, went to the world championship. I think they did a fantastic job. They didn't have one international competition before they go to the world championship for like two years. All they did was practicing in Tehran, and that's it. They they have a lot of potential. They I think a lot of them they can play college basketball division one, but the problem is there is nobody that is overlooking that league, and that's that's the main issue. What do you think infrastructure coaching system can do to improve in the world and get better exposure? H- having been to the United States yourself, we can't, and yourself there. We, can't, we can't do anything because we have the sanctions. So there is nobody willing to like deal with us. Like I'm going to give you an example, like Peak, uh, like the brand Peak is our sponsor for the national team. They can't even send us stuff because of the sanctions. So that's that's just like like the sanctions are the main issue here and there is nothing we can do about it because like let's say um, like this uh, uh, like the the website scouts.com or like this um, um, there are, there are a lot of like instagram pages right now that they cover high school basketball you know like you can you can talk to them and like you can get coverage for Iran too, you know, but um, because of the sanction, they're not, they're not willing to work with anybody, you know, anything related to Iran, it will stop them because then they will, they are like violating the rules in the United States. So that's, that's the main issue here. What, what about for somewhere like Europe? Cause we know about all about the, the football players who get to play in Portugal, Belgium, England, France, et cetera. What about uh, Europe as an option? Yes. So like uh, Europe, it's still the same issue. So like because of the sanctions and all that and like in Europe, we can go play, but you have to think about it like Iran. Um, like we are, we are pretty good in Asia, but when we go to Europe, they play a different style and our, our style really doesn't fit them. And then uh, we can we can play in Europe too, but 
in Europe, like a lot of guys, uh, they're like, okay, they don't they don't pay that much money. They can make more money back in Iran, and they just don't want to go. You know, that's one of the issues. And then, uh, what other reason they don't go to Europe? I mean, same thing. Like the there is no offers most mostly because I'm I'm sure a lot of players be willing to go to Europe and play, but there is no offers. So. Well, you're a part of the uh, 2017 uh, Asia uh, runner-ups. Uh, I mean, w- w- uh, and you helped lead that team with your experience. What do you tell other players that you know that have the skill for that and could potentially do well? I mean, what do you advise them? Uh, so, like, whenever a younger kid contacts me uh, and tell me, like, hey, you got any advice? My, my first advice to them is, uh, if they can afford and like their like their family, they're willing to let them go. I will tell them to like try to leave Iran in the early ages and try to like go to I don't know like some foreign countries because they will learn basketball differently and it will help them to uh, like get better and like go to like better teams and. Uh, play better basketball and uh, just that just try to like go out of Iran because they there are actually scouts that they will look at them like even even if they go for example like to to United Arab Emirates which is like not that far away from Iran just because of like the sanction if they go there there are some people that they're willing to like actually go there and see them play over there and I had like college coaches, like even when I was at Rice, imagine like I was their best player. They had me and they were asking me for players. And I was like, hey, in Iran, we have this guy. He's pretty good. He can come here. He's going to ball out. And they're like, uh, you know, like they weren't willing to take a risk to go to Iran. Well, I certainly hope that can, it can change in, in the future because as you said, you know, there's plenty of potential, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, uh, sw- switching gears, Ar- Arsalan, uh, back to uh, the, the, the big uh, spotlight that you just uh, left in, in Tokyo. Uh, you're coming off Iran's first Olympics appearance since Beijing 2008, uh, in, in, which, uh, in which they actually got to prepare, uh, I guess, because there wasn't a pandemic then and maybe it was a different uh, sanction situation. I, I remember watching the preparation for 2008. They were playing, they played against uh, NBA summer league teams and stuff like that as preparation. You didn't get that this time. Uh, so, I mean, with that being said, are, are you happy with uh, how yourself and the team did? Uh, definitely not happy. I think if we would have, uh, we would have had better uh, preparation. Uh, we would have definitely played better. Uh, but obviously there was the uh, pandemic for Corona and then uh, also like the sanctions so uh, it's, it was really tough for the federation to like try to have us travel to different countries you know and try to play friendly games so we only got to play five games before the olympics for the last two years you know and that was that was really tough obviously so when you when you go there and the first game against czech or the second game against us then france so like two of the teams in our group, they were in the finals of the Olympics. So uh, we knew that it was going to get, uh, it was going to be tough. And I'm not saying if we would have had better preparation, we would have beat France or US or Czech, but we would have definitely played better, you know? Well, you certainly challenged Czech Republic. You had a furious uh, 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 comeback to almost uh, catch up with them. You end up losing uh, unfortunately, by by six points, and then and then you have to deal with uh, a, a guy like uh, Damian Lillard and Kevin Durant uh, dumping threes on you. <laughs> uh, can you tell yeah. us about? Can you tell? Can you tell us? Uh, take us through that game against the U.S. I mean, you, uh, Hamed Hadadi, uh, who who uh, has a lot of NBA experience, played for five six years with the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, how how did you guys uh, help your teammates prepare for that one? Well, I mean, when you when you play in a game like that, uh, uh, I don't think you can really do anything because uh, I think 
excitement helped at most of the time, but we were kind of like overexcited for that game because there were a lot of guys that we see on TV. And obviously you mentioned how, me and Hamid, but uh, if you look at it this way, Hamid has been out of the league for, uh, I think, almost like seven or eight years now. And uh, so I think it was as exciting for the uh, for us as it was for the others. And when you get overexcited sometimes, you just... Uh, you just can't play as well as you want to. And that's how we started the game. And then they, they had that game against France. They, they played bad and they lost the game and they, they, couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't hit a brick that game. And they just came, came out that, that uh, game against us. And I think they, they shoot 60% from three-point line and they just lit us on fire. They could not hit hardly anything in their first game in, in their first pool play loss against France. And then, and then what do you know against Iran? They're, they're hitting everything. I <laughs> definitely watching that was not easy, man. But uh, I mean, just in terms of the experience playing against the, the, the giants of the U S uh, I mean, are, are you, are you happy that you guys at least got that experience? I mean, it kind of gave, uh, I guess, casually Iran fans flashbacks of 98 of a World Cup U.S. against Iran. Obviously, it went uh, very differently, but it, it was it was kind of cool to, to, to see you guys uh, kind of uh, embrace each other and show good sportsmanship at the end. Um, I mean, what was that experience for, for you like? I mean, uh, it was a great experience and uh, uh, sports is different than politics. And I think that that's what the U.S. players also understand, too. And they came out, tried to be friendly, you know, and uh, tried to put the, all the politics bullshit aside and just play some basketball and show, show the fans that there is nothing going on between people and whatever it is, is between the governments and it's mostly politics. And Iranians, they love Americans and Americans, they love Iranians as we see like and they were they were super nice too, you know. They're superstars at, at the end of the game. They um, they were holding hands, you know, <laughs> taking pictures with our guys, and it was it was great to see that. Anyone specifically that you got to talk to, into coaching staff or players for the U.S.? Oh, oh yeah, I knew. Uh, so uh, Jeremy Grant, uh, I was with Philadelphia. He got he got drafted the year after me. And I played with him for two summer leagues, so I know him. Uh, I know Chris Middleton. Uh, when I was at Rice, he was playing for a and We actually beat them. Uh, I saw him at uh, Detroit Pistons when I went to work out there. And we have the same agent, so I know Chris. And then he just won a championship. It was awesome. I was like, man, congratulations <laughs> on winning the championship. And now he has a gold medal. It's just crazy. I mean... Durant, I didn't know him that well, but I already played against him in 2010. Uh, I, oh, I know Coach uh, Lloyd, um, like one of the assistant coaches. He was the head coach for Philadelphia Summer League for two years, so he coached me as well. So there were a lot of guys that I knew on the U.S. team. Arsalan, uh, reflecting on your career, where you are now, where you have been, uh, I mean, you mentioned how uh, you uh, maybe re regret coming uh, and spending this time in Iran just because of the situation. Do you feel like you could make a return to the U.S. or try for Europe or any other league? Uh, well, I mean, I have tried, as I told you. Uh, I made a huge mistake, and it, was, it wasn't all my fault. Definitely having a bad agent, <laughs> bad, horrible agent, you know. Uh, that 2013 when I got drafted, uh, it really hurt me. So I recommend if any Iranians ever get to the situation that where I'm at right now, uh, make sure that he picks the right agent because it's really important for uh, his career, you know. So uh, that year that I went to Iran, uh, I mean, I had a great year, but as I told you, nobody's overlooking that league. So the year after that, I went to China and kind of like try to get away from Iran. And then after that, I came and tried to like uh, go uh, and try to make the roster for Philadelphia. They kind of messed me up. I don't want to get into it. Uh, again, uh, agent issues. 
And then right then was when I switched agents. And then uh, after I got uh, caught from the rockets, I went back to Iran and that's the second biggest mistake of my life. And I got stuck with Sarbazi back there. And I had to play for the army team for two years. And that kind of, uh, that's when I got, my career got kind of like hit pretty bad because I was in Iran. I wasn't playing for a best team in the league, which I usually do. Like I play for the top three teams in the past few years in Iran. So there was nobody even like paying attention to what I was doing, even though I was dropping big numbers. And then, I mean, I have been trying since then, but a lot of like uh, agents, uh, they're recommending me to like try to come back to the summer league and play in a summer league and then try to find a team from there, which is really tough. And uh, I don't know if it's possible for me to come back to the summer league because usually summer league is for the young guys and I'm 31 years old, so. We certainly have the resume resume for it, man. So the best best wishes with that. We're definitely rooting for you. Uh, Aria, I'll let you take it from here. Hey, listen, I was, listen, I was listening and enjoying that. But, um, you know, speaking about Iranian uh, basketball, uh, about the coaching in, in basketball, what do you what do you want to see changed? Um, when, what would you change if you were in charge? Um, and when it comes to other comparing to other countries what can iran learn? i and i mean obviously the sanctions obviously the limitations the iranian players have the country has we know that but you know we have to take you know we've got some fantastic talents like yourself like behnam yachali like um Hamid Haddadi, who obviously you know played in the nba what, how can iran now push on you know what do they have to do uh, okay, uh, one of the main issue is like most most of the people in Iran, uh, they just looking for result, you know. So I think if we want to get a good result, we have to look in the future and make some sacrifices, you know, and don't look at the short term result. So let's say we want to get start preparing for the Olympics in like two thousand and twenty six, okay, or when is it twenty four? But I'm sorry. So we yeah, have to, 24. even even like right now it's late to start, but if we want to start and like we have to start today, you know, start preparing and doing like all the things that are necessary uh, to like build a really good team to be ready for the competition, you know. And one of the, one of the problem in, uh, in Iran, I think, is in general, like other than soccer, because uh, they're getting like so much attention and like they have to kind of like inject a lot of money into soccer for like other sports. Um, like I, we started our preparation for the Olympics, let's say like two months before the Olympic was, was starting, you know, and then um, we just like practice, practice, you know, it, it takes a, a lot of time. They have, if, if they want to have a good team in four years, they have to start preparing from right now. They, have, they need to have good camps. The team needs to play a lot of good teams, you know, not just before the, when the game was supposed to be played, you know. And then, I, I mean, just like volleyball did, you know, like I think Julio Velasco took our volleyball team to the next level, you know. Carlos Queiroz took our football team to the next level. He gave them an ident identity. Uh, I think we need to have that, like, really good basketball coach to come in and like just change a whole lot of things in our basketball as well but i mean obviously that put a lot of pressure on the federation because they don't have money to do that and like basketball obviously is a is an american sport so in iran it doesn't get a lot of attention from uh, uh from like the sports ministry you know like Volleyball, they have a lot of sponsors, you know, they can afford to pay the coaches, like bring a foreigner coach. But uh, basketball, like we have, like, I, I know, like, our federation is taking a lot of pressure. And they don't have that much money to try to, like, bring a really great coach from outside. Arsala, yeah, we, are, are we going to see you in the uh, next uh, Asian Championships and hopefully uh, uh, Paris 2024? Uh, I mean... 
uh, whenever they want me, I was ready to play. So if they if they want me, I will continue to play and and uh, hopefully I can help the team achieve uh, its goals. You know. All right, let's finish off with some some fan questions. Um, yes. One question we got on Twitter from Aydin uh, Nach Javoni. He asks, um, is there any chance uh, any of the c- um, current national team players, such as Behnam Yachchali, like uh, Aaron Geramipur, Philip Jalalpur, are there a chance they can play in the NBA? Uh, it's going to be really hard. Really, really hard. I'm not going to say no because... There are always a possibility, but uh, um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, the next question comes from Hamide Balabadi. He asks, uh, what is your favorite kebab? Oh, bag. Come on, man. It has to be cool with it, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the last question, uh, that's actually going to come from myself. Of all the national team players for that for soccer for for football, who could have passed and present? Who could have been a great a great basketball player? I think Ali Dai. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I think because he played volleyball, you know, it, the height has to be. Yeah. I would go with a goalkeeper, to be honest. Personally. Oh yeah, Ob- Obed maybe. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Hey, what about, hey, about, about Sardar? I mean, his dad played yeah. there. He played volleyball as well. He could play basketball. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. But I think I think Ali Dai because he's, uh, I mean, he's a soccer player, football player, but uh, he's very intelligent. So I think he's a quick learner and he's probably the best guy to play basketball. We got a lot of questions on, on Twitter. We do apologize if you haven't answered them. Um, and we got it from Instagram on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, so you can you can just you can just forward it to me on Twitter and I can answer yeah. it over. Yeah, I mean if you want, you can obviously do that. So that's not a problem. Um I appreciate the time, Arsalan. I really do. Yes, of uh, course. Uh, uh I mean there, Samson. I really, I really tried my best. I don't think if I have spoken that much English in like the past <laughs> seven years. <laughs> last time probably I had a presentation for my business class. <laughs> I spoke that <laughs> much English, but uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, hear the edited version, you know? <laughs> yeah, you were great, man. You were great. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, just on, on behalf of uh, you know any Iranian-American uh, basketball fan, uh, like myself, like so many others, Arsalan, you, you've done, uh, I mean, you have uh, surpassed so many barriers just with your playing ability and just your ambition. So I, I want to thank you uh, uh, for, for that, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, uh, Arsalan Kazemi, six foot seven power forward of the Iranian national team and longtime professional basketball player, Rice University. Oregon Ducks in Iran and China and the, and the NBA. We're also, of course, as always, on all social medias at, at Govizan. Any any questions you have for us, uh, feel free to uh, give a comment whenever we put this out and, and uh, feel free to follow us and subscribe again. And thanks, uh, everyone, for listening. On behalf of uh, Arya Alavardi, this is Samson Tamajani. We're going to return very soon for more uh, episodes of Govizan and more updates of what's happening in the world of Team Elite.